Well, welcome. My name is Liz Kovart. Um, I'm working on a, translating my dissertation into a book, uh, which looks mostly at the history of Albany, New York. And as I researched my dissertation, I came across this really interesting fact. So scholars termed the Battle of Saratoga correctly as the turning point of the revolution. If the Patriots had lost that battle, who knows if the French would have joined the fray. And the Patriots really needed French Navy ships, French um, soldiers, and French money um, to trap Cornwallis in 1781. But what most scholars don't actually talk about is the Patriots almost lost the Battle of Saratoga. And they lost because they were embroiled in regional squabbling, uh, most of it cultural. Um, and today we're going to look at how Yankee Yorker jealousy affected the Battle of Saratoga. We could spend days talking about the jealousy and the roots of it um, to start with. But today we'll limit it to Saratoga. Yankee Yorker jealousy affected the um, Patriots' work towards Saratoga in two ways. First in the commissary department and then in um, command. So where does this all begin? It begins pretty much in May 1775. New England is at war. The Patriots have said um, at Lexington and Concord, we're not necessarily looking for reconciliation. Um, if we are, we're going we're gonna to fight for it to get our, our rights. New York, there are a little more undecided. They're not really quite sure what they're going to do yet. Um, so they're a little bit more reluctant to act. And this makes the Patriots in New England nervous. See, if they're going to actually get the British, um, to, or I shouldn't say because they're all British at that point, but they're going to get the Redcoats to leave them alone um, or to get them out of Boston, they're going to need more arms. Specifically, they're going to need cannon. But New England doesn't have a lot of cannon lying around, and the Redcoats have gone through it and pretty much taken what they had. So the Patriots of New England look to New York, specifically to Fort Ticonderoga, where there is just an invalid regiment of 15 to 30 Redcoats stationed at Ty Fort Ty, but there's a lot of cannon. So Ethan Allen starts marching over with his Green Mountain Boys from what is Vermont. At that point in time, it's called the New Hampshire Grants. And Benedict Arnold comes up from Connecticut. Again, New York hasn't declared war. So when these guys, these patriots, write to the Albany Committee of Safety and ask for help, Albany's like, well, we have to put you off because we just we can't act right now. So on May 24, 1775, the New Englanders storm Fort Ticonderoga and take the cannon. They have a lot of men up there, and all of a sudden, they need food and supplies. So they write to the Albany Committee again and ask for help. At this point, the New York Provincial Congress has said, OK, we're going to get into the war, so go ahead, Albany, help these guys out. So Albany appoints five men to help gather food and supplies um, and help the Patriots of New England um, do what they need to do at Fort Ticonderoga. This is where the confusion and the jealousy starts to develop um, on our path to Saratoga, is in this quest of supply. So not long after Albany supplies five men to, to handle the supply efforts, Connecticut appoints Alicia Phelps on June 7, 1775. And his goal is to handle supplying um, the Patriot forces at Fort Ticonderoga. He arrives in Albany, and the main, one of the main commissaries there, John N. Blaker, is out of town. He's on a supply mission. And Phelps asks his subordinate for the supplies. And the subordinate's like, I don't know you, you don't know me, I can't hand you over everything that Blaker has until we, you know, so sort this out. So Alicia Phelps gets all upset, he writes all these letters, um, and he acts like the people of Albany don't want to help him, which isn't true. As soon as Blaker comes back, he said, okay, I see your command, um, you know, here are the supplies. But confusion still reigns because the Continental Congress is going to get in the mix. In, they are going to want to, Continental Congress wants to invade Canada. They, um, they believe that Canada is the, um, and this is, sorry, this is uh, Ethan Allen on the top, Benedict Arnold on the bottom, and another picture of Fort Tide. Um, the Continental Congress is going to appoint Philip Schuyler to head the Northern Department. And what the Northern Department is tasked with is invading Canada. 
Skyler is very particular. He's also a great man for the job. Skyler grew up in Albany. He knows all the routes um, to and from Canada. He had uh, worked as a trader and a surveyor. He had also been in the commissary department during the French and Indian War. He knows exactly what kind of supplies the Continental Army is going to need in their invasion of Canada. So he appoints his nephew, Walter Livingston, to head the commissary department. So as you can imagine, Alicia Phelps is not so happy about this. Um, there's actually a lot of problems in the commissary department just because the jobs in the commissary are seen as avenues to wealth. The government gives you money and your job is supposed to supply, you know, supply the army. So who are you going to get these supplies from? You're going to get them from your friends your family members, and other people in your colony. So just like Philip Schuyler gives the job of the commissary to his nephew, Walter Livingston, Livingston starts spending 47,000 pounds New York currency uh, with his friends and relatives, Philip von Rensselaer, Henry von Rensselaer, and Tunis von Fechten. So Alicia Phelps is feeling a little bit, a little bit left out. And if you needed to know any more about how the commissary leads to wealth, well, here's just another example. In April 1776, Walter Livingston, um, Walter Livingston actually um, submits a plan to Congress for a court contract that will actually result in a 700% profit. But it's not just the New Yorkers who are trying to profit. Alicia Phelps actually overcharged Congress by 1,200. Uh, pounds New York currency. So everybody's trying to make some money here uh, in the commissary department. Now, the command in the commissary gets muddied again because Continental Congress on July 19, 1775, appoints Joseph Trumbull of Connecticut to be the commissary general for the entire Continental Army. And unfortunately, Joseph died young, so there was no picture of him. So this is a picture pictures of his illustrious family members all of which who served uh, important roles in the War for Independence. Now, Trumbull had proven himself during the Siege of Boston. Uh, Congress knew he would be capable of getting supplies. Trumbull was a merchant by trade, um, so that's why they appointed him to the Continental Army. Now, he comes in, he supersedes Livingston with his buddy, Alicia, uh, Alicia Avery. Lots of Alicia's in this story. Um, so Livingston is not really happy about this. Uh, he tries to get along with both Trumbull and Alicia Avery. He's willing to submit to Trumbull's demands, but he's really not happy about it. So what, what does this fighting in the commissary department and confusion have to do with, with the Canada expedition and ultimately Saratoga? Well, there's so much fighting that no one's really doing any supplying. Um, you have the men from Connecticut that Alicia Avery and Alicia Phelps have appointed, and they're going throughout Albany County, which is a huge county in upstate New York at that point, or up colony New York, um, offending every farmer in town. Um, they don't know, they just believe that the farmers should be willing to give them supplies, take continental credit um, without hard currency, and the farmers are like, no, we don't know you, we don't trust you, we want hard cash, or we're not gonna get any supplies. The New York commissary spends a lot of time going out and smoothing over the, the farmers' ruffled feathers. Um, so morale in the northern department is pretty low, because everybody knows that this infighting in the command uh, in the commissary department is going on. To make matters worse, Congress writes to Schuyler and orders him to start the Canada expedition. Schuyler's like, look, we're not ready yet, but I have my orders, so we're going to have to go. So in September 1775, pretty bad time of year to start an invasion in Canada, uh, the Continental Army starts its march on its way to Canada. Now, Schuyler is not with him. He has the ague. So Richard Montgomery pretty much leads um, that command. Now, as you can imagine, as our polar vortex has shown us, winter in, in upstate New York, Canada, and in New England can be rather harsh. And it was harsh that winter. Um, it was very cold. Roads become impassable. So even the supplies that the um, commissary department can gather, they can't get to the troops. Um, and when they get to Canada, the Patriots are a little surprised. See, they thought they'd go to Canada and the Canadians would be like, yeah, we want to join the rebellion too. And they're like, no. So the Canadian merchants are not willing to supply the Patriots with the supplies they need. They're not interested in joining the Patriot cause. Those merchants that are willing to sell them supplies, they want hard currency too, um, which the Patriots lack. In the end, Canada fails. Like, 
The Americans go in, they capture Quebec, um, they, but they can't hold it. So they end up making a hasty retreat, and a large part of that failure is just failure of supplies. They can't supply their men with warm clothing, with food, with firewood, or anything else that they need um, to supply or need to live in, um, in Canada. So this is a bit humiliating for the Congress uh, and the um, soon-to-be United States. And so there's the blame game that starts up. So New Englanders are blaming the New Yorkers. The New Yorkers are blaming the New Englanders. Congress decides they want in on this game, and they're divided into whether they're New English allies or New Yorker allies. Um, and then the New York Provincial Congress said, wait a second, we're going to get to the root of this, and they launch an investigation to see who's at fault. Is it the people of the city and county of Albany? Did the Albany County uh, Committee of Safety not do enough? Are we talking just about the commissaries? Is it their fault? Who's responsible? So they launch a thorough investigation. They look at provision returns. They look at prices paid. They look at the number of wagons of, uh, that were employed. They look at the availability of foodstuffs that could have been sent uh, to Canada. They analyze Philip Schuyler, Alicia Avery, and Walter Livingston's accounts. And what they turn up is there is a little bit of pot stirring um, that may have hurt them. They uncover a letter from James Yancey, who was appointed by Alicia Avery, so he's from Connecticut, or at least in that band of Connecticut commissaries. Um, he wrote a letter to the Bennington Committee of Safety. Not a popular move if you're from New York. Vermont, Bennington's in what is now Vermont, but that land is contested. New England says they own it, New York says they own it, everybody's got a bit of interest in it, um, so that nobody likes dealing with, with Vermont anyway. Um, but James Yancey writes to Bennington hoping to find a sympathetic ear, and he says, I need you to ship immediately, I need you to immediately ship flour to Fort Ticonderoga, and I don't care what you have to pay to get it there, just get it there. In fact, he says, quote, some evil-minded people in and about Albany have stopped the provisions from going up to Ticonderoga, end quote. So he portrays the situation um, of supply to Ticonderoga as solely the people of New York's fault. Um, there's insinuations that are out the ranks. One militia unit actually says they hope to see Albany burn for their evil behavior. Um, Alicia Avery, he's shown this letter during the, this investigation. He says, I have no idea why James Yancey wrote this or, or that he wrote it. I have found the New Yorkers to be nothing but helpful. So the New York Provincial Congress clears Albany and the New Yorkers of any fault. Um, but we still don't know exactly who's at fault um, for the commissary problems. I'm willing to place blame on, on everybody on that. So Yankee Yorker jealousy, here's a battle with Quebec, sorry, I got so engrossed in the um, presentation I forgot to actually give you the slides I made. So this is good bad. <laughs> um, Richard Montgomery is going to die here, and remember the Trumbull family? John Trumbull painted the fall of Richard Montgomery, among other things. So he dies at that battle. Um, who's to blame? New York. We're going to investigate everybody. Who's, who's at fault there? And here we are. Now we're, we're back to where we're supposed to be. So Yankee Yorker jealousy also finds its way into command. So you have Philip Schuyler and Horatio Gates. Horatio Gates is not even from New England, but the New Englanders love him because he showed up at the siege of Boston and he proved instrumental in helping uh, get the British to evacuate Boston. The New Englanders like Gates because he gets along with the men, he's very egalitarian and democratic, whereas Schuyler is seen as this Dutch patrician who has this lofty attitude who could care less what his subordinates think. The New Yorkers like him, they understand Schuyler culturally, where he's coming from, uh, but the New Englanders do not. So there's controversy, of course. So Schuyler, he gets the blame for Canada. Uh, and the New Englanders seize upon this to try and get Gates the command of the Northern Department. They start writing to their um, delegates in the Continental Congress, trying to get Gates the command. The New Yorkers are still sticking up for Kyler. And so the Continental Congress decides, well, we're going to seek a middle path here. We're going to give Gates the control of the army in Canada. So this is happening actually just before they lose, uh, the Patriots lose Canada. And we're going to give Philip Schuyler command of everything else. So by the time Horatio Gates makes his way up to Albany, the Patriots have evacuated Canada. 
And Gates goes, well, you see, that's my army. It came from Canada. Clearly, that's what the Continental Congress wanted, was for me to control the army that came from Canada. And Philip Schuyler goes, no, it said the army in Canada, and we don't have an army in Canada anymore, so it's my army. So this creates, of course, a lot of problems. So what Congress is going to do is they're going to be like, all right, nobody's focusing on battles or planning or anything else. You're just focusing on command. So what we're going to do is we're going to make Gates a commander of all the troops at Fort Ticonderoga. And that's one of the places that the Patriots fall back to is Fort Ty. And it sits right on the, Cham um, on the Hudson River Sh Lake Champlain corridor, so it's a really important point. And everybody, especially Schuyler, knows at this point that the British are going to come down from Canada, and he suspects they're going to march from New York City um, down the Hudson uh, River. So Fort Ty is important. Schuyler knows that he's going to need about 10,000 men to guard Fort Ty, but neither he nor Gates can get the New Englanders or the New Yorkers to turn out. In fact, the soldiers that do turn out uh, during the winter of 76-77 uh, arrive in Albany half naked and diseased. So they need 10,000 men just at Fort Ticonderoga, and all they can muster is about 3,500 men. Well, Gates is not happy with this situation. He runs back down to the Continental Congress to make his plea in person for command. So Arthur Sinclair is given uh, command of Fort Ticonderoga. Now, John Burgoyne is going to march down the Hudson River, and he's going to have a two-pronged assault he is going to take 8,000 men, and he will personally lead them down the Hudson River, but he sends Barry St. Ledger with 2,000 men to march in from the Mohawk Valley. Their target is Al Albany. If they can control Albany, then they will have a clear shot down to New York City, which is already in the hands of the British. So on June 13, 1777, Burgoyne launches his assault down the Champlain River. By July 2nd, uh, 1777, between July 2nd and July 5th, he takes Fort Ticonderoga. Congress really mad about the loss. They blame Schuyler. Um, they end up replacing Schuyler with Gates, which works out great for Gates and horribly for Schuyler, because Schuyler did a lot to beef up um, the defenses around the Hudson River. He went and had his men cut up trees. Um, I don't, I don't want to get this right, but basically chopped down um, the dams that were, or dikes that were holding up water. Um, so he's flooding the forest because Burgoyne has this really long wagon train, so he's making it sure that they get stuck in the mud um, for that. But, but Gates is the one that's going to get all the credit um, for Tycon, or, uh, for Saratoga, rather. So the New Englanders are happy about this, but they're not necessarily showing up in any great numbers uh, when Gates when word of Gates' command starts to spread. So what gets the New Englanders and the New Yorkers to finally cooperate, to finally form some sort of unified army that works towards one goal? The murder of Jane McCrae. Now Jane McCrae is this, um, she's a loyalist, she's waiting, she refuses to evacuate, everybody knows Burgoyne is com uh, coming. The Albany Committee sends orders that anybody in the area should evacuate. McCray says, no, I'm going to stay. My officer, Bo, is coming down with the British Army. I'm going to wait for him. Well, Burgoyne's Haudenosaunee allies, uh, the Iroquois, some of the members of the Iroquois nations, um, they go through, through their terms of warfare, and they end up killing and scalping Jane McCray and others. Paintings like this are, are, are painted. Um, propaganda flows around that you know Burgoyne can't control his Indians, so if you don't do something, they're going to come into your town. This plays on fears of, of cent, you know, like a century of imperial warfare where um, Native American allies had gone through and, and massacred towns like Schenectady and Deerfield, Massachusetts. So nobody wants this to happen. So New Yorkers and New Englanders alike start turning out in droves, and they all end up um, at Saratoga. So the battles of Saratoga start on September 19, 1777. That's when you have the Battle of Freeman's Farms. The other, uh, the other big battle is on October 7, 1777 at Venus Heights. It all leads to Burgoyne's surrender. This is huge. The French go, wow, those patriots, they can actually stick it out and defeat a major British force. And at this time, that's not an easy feat because the British Army is the best army in the entire world, the most well-equipped and highly trained army. Um, so the French are impressed. Sir Bernier 
King Louis the 16th, they decide, well, we're going to join this fray. Um, and on Octo uh, March 17, uh, 1778, they declare war on Great Britain. They start sending ships. They start sending men. And then and they start sending money. So in the end, um, the Americans are able to corner Cornwallis at Yorktown in October 1781. So almost, what is that? three or four years after the Battle of Saratoga, um, Cornwallis surrenders and the fighting uh, ends. So that's, that's the end of that story. Um, it's kind of a long, kind of confusing one. It just gives you an idea of what the confusion may, must have been like in terms of who's in command or who's in the commissary department. But that turning point of the revolution, that very important battle, almost didn't happen um, because the Americans weren't united uh, they weren't united in whether they were going to be patriot loyalists or to ride somewhere in the middle. And even those who were patriot weren't necessarily united into whether they were going to support the cause. What did play a big role? Region. What is best for my region? What is best for my people? It all goes back to these local fighting, infighting, and uh, that took a major toll and almost cost the patriots this big, big battle. So that's all I have. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to explain something further or try and answer them. Yep. Uh, Liz, this is way more interesting and uh, variegated story than uh, you know, uh, headlines we usually think of with the Battle of Saratoga. And, and you, did you say this came out of a dissertation? I mean, this sounds like way yeah, more interesting than Yeah, it, it came uh, out of a dissertation, and I, I'm, I like details, so there's a lot of details in that. I don't know how it all translates into the book, but um, I think this is about chapter six, five, six of the book. So where is this book in life? Um, I'm going to call it America's First Gateway. And I don't know what the title after the semicolon will be, but it's going to look at how Americans form cultural communities um, to become Americans. So I'm actually a New Englander, but my advisor was like, oh, you should study New York and specifically Albany. More on that later if you want to attend the post-revolution New England migration talk. Um, but New England, it's founded by English people. In New York, it's founded by Dutch people who aren't all Dutch. So they almost have to become Dutch before they become British, before they become American. So it's a really neat, complex story. Um, and this is just part of the, the story that plays in as war affects these cultural communities. And sometimes these cultural communities have a hard time adapting um, to the situations around them. So with that. Um, you made a distinction about uh, Gates being in control of the Canada of, uh, Army in Canada and uh, the other book, the Yellow Film, who's saying, excuse me, being in control of America. Why is it that Britain at that point, or uh, that, that, we're, uh, that the United States runner is, or the coming of the United States, is making distinctions between uh, American and Canadian colonies at that point? Because they're all still British colonies. So why is there a distinction? Yeah. Well, they. Canada, they, they hope Canada will join the rebellion, but it's not going to happen. Um, so they do make a distinction between Canada. Also, Canada at that point has been largely French. They are just new Britons. So the, the traditional Britons, the ones that live in the 13 colonies, still aren't quite make, sure what to make of these Frenchmen, some of whom are Catholic, um, which the New Englanders in particular are very wary about. They're fighting over the Quebec Act, um, or lumping it in with the Intolerable Acts uh, shows this. So that's why they would make a distinction between Canada. The Continental Congress, they're just, I think sometimes they, they get so embroiled in fighting, they're just trying to put out like little fires all the time. And this was a fire that could you know, become a really big blaze. So they're trying to just kind of put a temporary hold on it. So they're like, all right, well, we'll appease the New Englanders who are very vocal in Congress. Um, and we'll give Gates, we'll give their man Gates a little bit of something. And we'll make it Canada so we can tell the New Yorkers we're not taking away Philip Tyler's command at all, but we're going to keep his activities in New York. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a compromise that they're hoping will kind of smooth things over and put out this flame, but all it really does is make people angry. OK, after the battle, um, did, that, did, did the outcome of the battle uh, sort of serve to sort of quell these inter-regional rivalries for a time? Or were they sort of bubbling under the surface? Or did they, I mean, 
did, did you like New Yorkers and New Englanders, or did it, what happened? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I haven't thought about it long term. The New Englanders are going to invade New York after the revolution, and there's going to be a lot of similar cultural infighting along the settled communities of the Hudson River. Because the New Englanders are going to go in and they're like, ha, ah, we're going to turn this into a second New England. And they do that in much of New York State. They basically reestablish and replant their new New England towns, architecture and everything, in the New York frontier. And that just proves harder to do um, on the settlements of the Hudson. And in fact, the New York Yankees are actually going to invade New York City, too. At one point, there's going to be a New England majority in New York City um, and the culture that develops there um, as well. So. There are going to be problems. So to answer your question, I think they're still bubbling under the surface. Um, but especially as the war goes further south, it's a little less close to home. They're not worried about um, the British at that point invading from Canada into the New England frontier or into New York at that point. Um, there is going to be some outlets for it. I am doing. I need to do some more research on this. But Sullivan and um, George Clinton's brother, James. James Clinton are going to lead an assault on the Haudenosaunee peoples of Western New York um, in 1778, 1779, I think, is one of their campaigns. So Sull what's known as Sullivan's campaigns, and they're gonna massacre a lot of civilians and Native Americans during that. And the Native Americans and the Loyalists who are fighting the, um, Sullivan's expedition as well, they're gonna massacre people as well. So I think there's just some sort of outlets of like, oh, you're driving me nuts, and it's like, oh, I killed a Yorker today, or I killed an Indian today. Um, I don't know. I have to do a little bit more research, but I suspect that they're just bubbling under. And for those who go south, it's just a little less present because they're not that close to home. I wonder if I you could talk more about the cultural clash that you mentioned, because um, I really like what you're saying about uh, the sort of this political infighting and and uh, you know, basically rival. <coughs> political uh, regionalism. Can you broaden that out and talk about the cultural piece? Because you, you allude to it, and I, I think that's really intriguing. OK, how can I do this in like 60 seconds? So the New Englanders, I'm going to simplify this, but the New Englanders think of them as land hungry. They build their towns with the idea that everybody is going to get a piece of the land. And that only works for the first couple of generations. And then they start looking uh, west to New York where the Dutch have not done a great job of supplying their colony with people. So the New Englanders from Connecticut go in and they basically take Long Island. And Governor Stuyvesant is like, okay, well, there's not much I can do here. I'm gonna let you have the land, just you need to behave yourselves. And you know, just know that you're in the jurisdiction of New Netherland and not in the jurisdiction of Connecticut. And that doesn't always work because they do what they, they wanna do. Um, so the New Englanders are always looking to get into New York, but they don't want it to be part of New Netherland or part of New York. They want it to be part of New England. And you see this on the eastern banks um, of the Hudson River. New York and Massachusetts, they're not going to settle their boundary until 1786. And part of that is because it's, it's political, but the other part is it's just New Englanders and New Yorkers, they just have a very different outlook. New, New England tends to be very homogenous. Um, they tend to be congregationalists, which is not all that, there, it is different, but not all that different from the Dutch Reform Calvinism. Um, so they have different religious views, but they have different ways of, of building things. So even like um, the city of Albany and um, the Sophos and other um, uh, areas in New York are going to look very different than a New England village. So it just goes back to the colonial roots. Um, and there's a lot of infighting and hard feelings um, during colonial wars, like Queen Anne's War, King William's War, King George's War, um, that, that you could root this cause to. So I hope that answered your question. We don't, I talk hours on it, but I just don't have a lot I'm of I'm just wondering how that cultural class shows itself in sort of this commissary, who's in charge, uh, or is that, I'm not sure how that plays out in the actual They don't trust event. each other, so like, okay. Trumbull takes Livingston because he has to to appease Schuyler, not because he wants Livingston. If Trumbull had his way, it would be all Connecticut people. Just as if like Schuyler had his way, he would not appoint anybody from Connecticut uh, in the commissary. He would have them all be New Yorkers. So some of it is just local, you know, this is the way we do things here and you don't get it. Um, so, and, and, and some of that is, is cultural, but I can't right off the top of my head think of it as a specific example of that. 
was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the murder of Jane McRae. I, I'm not familiar with this particular event, but I, I, what I was hearing was like, we're fighting, we're fighting, we're fighting. Oh my God, the Americans are family people. And that sort of like gets over the regional differences, this sort of threat from it brings the threat real. So the New Englanders start turning out because they don't, if, if Burgoyne gets into New York, how, how quick is he going to get into the Hampshire Grants in New Hampshire um, or Connecticut or Massachusetts? And the only place the British, I think, are at that point is, is in like Newport, Rhode Island. Um, so they're, New England is largely a British free zone and they, they don't want the British soldiers back. Um, they also have a long history of you know, going back of French and Indian warfare or British and Indian warfare in the countryside and towns get massacred because of that in the war. So when Jane McRae and other civilians are killed in that incident, it's saying the British are coming and they can't control what comes with them. So we're going to have another Deerfield. We're going to have another Schenectady massacre on our hands. But the fact that Jane McRae is a woman who's supposed to be innocent, like there's no way she'd be involved in the war. She was waiting her bow. Most people would just forget the fact that you know she was a loyalist waiting for British officer betrothed to come down um, with Burgoyne's army. It was just like she was an innocent. Indians massacred her. Burgoyne has no control over over his Indian allies, and they're coming to our town next. Um, so that that's what that incident does. Is it says we don't want them in our town. We have to do something if we're gonna if we're gonna stop them. Just uh, quickly, your research on um, support or um, oppose the contention that Benedict Arnold maybe was more instrumental in the Saratoga victory than Gates himself. I am not a military historian. I talk about this controversy because it plays into the cultural, but I don't really go into that. Um, but from what I've read, Benedict Arnold was a hero of Saratoga. At this point, you know, he's really a hero of the whole thing, and he does he does get the. He's one of the officers that gets the shaft in terms of promotion, uh, which is what they say drove him to be, become a traitor. But at this point, he's a hero um, and an underappreciated one. But Gates, Gates just kind of takes all of the happiness from the battle. He takes all of the accolades from the battle. But I, I read, you know, sympathetic accounts of Gates too that says, you know, he really knew what he was doing um, and whatnot. But I, you know, I tend to stick up for Skyler because very few people do. I think that, but I do think he got the shaft a little bit. All right, well, if there are any other questions, you're more than welcome to come and uh, ask me. I want to just give you a few minutes uh, break before the next session. Um, in, at 11.15, John Bell will be in here to talk about the Boston bankruptcy that led to the American Revolution. That's what will be in this room. If you want to learn more about the Erie Canal, I'll be up on the second floor uh, talking about from frolic to green idea. But thank you very much for coming and thank you for your questions. I hope you enjoy the rest of your history.